Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Drug Portfolio Information Session. This is our annual review of the Pharmaceutical Reviews Program and uh, changes related to the work that we do within the portfolio and across the organization. My name is Brent Fraser. I'm Vice President of Pharmaceutical Reviews. Next slide. Just a brief outline of the agenda today. We'll have opening remarks by Suzanne McGurn, who's our president and CEO of CADF. I will be providing a brief overview of uh, the pharmaceutical reviews portfolio, focusing on a couple of areas, and Trevor will be providing the main uh, update on program changes. He's the director of the uh, drug pharmaceutical reviews program. We also will have some presentations um, by Nicole Mittman, who will be talking about real world evidence, deliberative frameworks and scientific advice. And she's our vice president of evidence standards. And she's the chief scientist uh, for CADF. Heather Logan, who is the executive strategy lead will be providing an update on living reviews uh, for COVID-19 treatments. Sarah Bergless, who's manager of patient engagement, will be uh, talking about patient engagement and some of the changes related to those activities. And Randy Allen, who is the director of communications, will talk about some of the changes that we'll be making to the CADF reports. We'll then have an open forum and uh, wrapping up at the end of the uh, session. Next slide, please. So just some housekeeping uh, items, please submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A tab that is in the Zoom control bar. So that's either at the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen. Please note that we will not be taking questions during the presentations. We'll be holding them off until the um, uh, open forum at the end of the presentations. Also, the presentation will be recorded and it will be posted on CADIS YouTube channel later this week. So I will uh, hand it over to Suzanne McGurn to provide some opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Brent. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's event as well. I'd like to start with a territorial acknowledgement and uh, let folks know that I'm speaking to you today from just outside of Ottawa. Uh, which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. But I've spent most of my life living just north of Napanee, Ontario, on traditional land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning, including the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte and other member nations, and it is still home to many First Nation and Métis people. These Indigenous nations committed to mutual sharing obligations and responsibility as stewards of the land and the water. Today, these responsibilities and obligations extend to all people. Our Canadian lands are steeped in rich Indigenous history, traditions, and modern cultures that are proud and vib vibrant. I encourage everyone participating today to take a moment and reflect about the land from where you're participating and the people that have come before who are stewards of that land. For those of you new to CADETH events, CADETH is one of the pan-Canadian organizations that is funded primarily by the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to provide evidence to support policy and healthcare decision makers in assessing, introducing, and managing health technologies, including pharmaceuticals, with the objective of achieving better outcomes and value for Canadians. We are commonly referred to as a large HTA producer, health technology assessment producer. I'm very proud to have joined CADETH recently. This is the first time that I've had the privilege to meet with this group. For those of you who don't know me, I'm still the relatively new CEO and president. Last week, I re reached my 100th day mark. My background that has led me to CADETH includes a career as a nurse, augmented with a master's of public policy. Over my career, I've held numerous nursing roles in almost every sector you could imagine, as well as much of the last two decades have been working as a civil servant in Ontario with responsibility for physician services, OHIP, health human resources, drugs and devices. And uh, I've also had the opportunity to serve on CADIS board and be the inaugural chair of the uh, Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical uh, 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 Align, uh, the PCPA, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alignment. 
Um, as well as most recently, when the pandemic arrived, I was actually spending my time running the uh, a provincial uh, a correctional facilities. Certainly was an interesting time and, and has really shaped um, my thinking about evidence as I've come to CADIC. I thought perhaps the right place to start today was just to talk a little bit about the recent CATA symposium. Uh, the theme for the CATA symposium, which just occurred a couple of weeks ago, decision making in an age of uncertainty, ironically was chosen well over a year ago, and it seemed very relevant at the time. It was chosen during a period of time when it felt like there was a perfect storm, health system transformation was underway, many things contributing to the uh, the uncertainty, including discussions about national drug agencies, national pharmacare program, a review of organizations like Cadeth um, uh, about uh, how, how did they need to support decision makers into the future. Never ending conversations, as I'm sure all of you on the phone are aware of, about affordability. How did we think about being able to benefit from all of the promising and disruptive technologies uh, what with the concerns of affordability. All of these factors produced a heightened sense of uncertainty, which made, made the theme for the symposium very relevant. In my former job as a civil servant and a, uh, being responsible for running programs, uncertainty has been a fact of life. It, it is never a circumstance where with a new drug, I shouldn't say never, rarely with a new drug, medical device, diagnostic tool or surgical in intervention, do we have all of the information that we need to be able to inform decisions? Whether you're a decision maker in a government, a health system, a patient, a clinician, a policy maker, a manufacturer of technology or a payer. That's sort of what the world looked like as I uh, made the decision to move to CADA. And then COVID-19 happened. And as we all started using the hourly or often more frequently word, which has now been determined to be Oxford's word of 2020, the unprecedented circumstances of 2020, it wasn't just that the theme of uncertainty was front and center. It became integral to every aspect of our everyday life. Although there was a great deal of uncertainty back in March and early April, there was also a need for quick and decisive action and a demand for timely evidence. And that demand took on a new tenor and that tenor has continued. It's brought into sharp focus important dialogue about evidence, quality, timeliness, certainty, or often more often, more off, more often uncertainty. And how we talk about and understand evidence, particularly by the public. I know myself, I was glued to TV in April and May to watch the governor of New York updates, in part because I was so intrigued by how much evidence he was able to communicate, both of what was unknown, what was known, and where they still had lots of questions with such simple slides and in a way that was understandable to people. So when I joined Cadeth a little over 100 days ago, I moved into a place where I'm now leading an organization that produces evidence to help decision makers make these informed decisions. And the role of, at the same time that the role of evidence has changed completely. How daunting it, it feels to have a mission of consistently delivering credible scientific evidence and management strategies that enable the appropriate use of health technologies where over the last nine months, it's often felt that we're, we're spending days where we're flying by the, the seat of our pants, even though we've had the greatest leadership, access to the best researchers and public, uh, public health minds, it's still very difficult to be able to make the kinds of sweeping decisions that need to be made when there is so much uncertainty. So the virus continues to transform our everyday lives in hundreds of ways, big and small, from who we see, where we work, from social distancing to masking to washing our hands. And as I was uh, uh, sharing at, at the session earlier this week, where we're having conversations with news anchors talking about when was their last handshake? Was it before or after COVID hit? You know, And conversations about, will we remember how to hug? conversations that were imaginable less than a year ago. So I'm at Cadeth at a point in time where we're faced with um, looking forward to a world that 
hopefully we'll have, have learned many things. There's things to draw on that were normal before the pandemic. We've learned many things during the pandemic that we will want to build on. And there's many things in the future that we don't yet know. So we'll be starting our strategic journey in the near future. And I think for all of us, we have lots to learn from this experience. I do wanna thank everyone who's on this call here at Cadith, at other health technology um, as, uh, groups, Penn Canadian research organization, academics, and most of all, uh, industry. Um, the industry has certainly stepped up uh, during this time period. And I think for people who do see perhaps some return to normalcy in the future, it will come from the innovations and the response of uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry and other technology industry to this although always talked about, I think truly uh, poorly imagined future. So thank you all. I look forward to hearing the discussion today and moderating the questions at the end. Please feel free to jot your questions down as individuals are speaking. Uh, we, I will be able to go back to them. So as questions arise, please feel free to jot them in, but we will not take those questions to the very end. So at this point, I'm passing it back to Brent to introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, next slide, please. So I'll focus on the uh, first two parts of this uh, update related to the COVID-19 uh, impact on our reviews, as well as the transparency initiative. And as I mentioned, Trevor will be speaking about uh, a number of the updates that have been uh, implemented within the pharmaceutical reviews program. Next slide. So as mentioned, um, many of us were all dealing with the impact of COVID-19. Uh, earlier this year, a decision was made that we would shut down both the Toronto office and the Ottawa office uh, fairly early in the pandemic. Fortunately though, the drug review timelines have been um, kept up, to, or kept up uh, and we've been able to complete our reviews within our targeted timelines. We have not had any specific delays related to COVID-19. However, there were some submissions that were pushed out a little bit because the manufacturer had made a decision to hold off at that point in time uh, and delay the submission. Some of the rationale for that was related to the impact of COVID-19 on their uh, own uh, companies. We didn't have any delays with respect to our expert committee meetings and uh, fortunately we were able to shift very quickly to a webinar format with our uh, expert committees. Uh, the virtual format has been, I think, quite an experience and uh, we've learned a lot through that. Uh, initially, when we had talked about this in the past, there was a lot of hesitation but I give a lot of credit to our committee members because they were able to shift very quickly to the virtual format. And I think that they have been a, good, a great success. We've also started shifting a number of our meetings into a virtual format or through teleconference, our pre-submission meetings, our checkpoint meetings to take advantage of this technology uh, during this particular time. We have made a few accommodations and support with for clinician submissions and patient submissions that have been uh, impacted by COVID-19. So if there were some challenges related to the timelines, which are fairly tight to begin with, but even more so with the impact of COVID, uh, we were able to extend some of those timelines so that we could get the information included into our reviews. And as many of you know, um, we had to delay some of our consultations. Um, and as a result of that, we impacted the uh, implementation dates for some of the changes that are related to the alignment work that we've been undertaking for a little over a year now. Next slide. One of the key things I wanted to speak to folks about is the transparency piece. And as you know, from our previous consultations and webinars, transparency is something that Cadeth holds very highly. 
And this is one of our key values. And it is important that we reduce the amount of redactions within our reports and try to be as transparent as possible. We've had two consultations on a proposed, uh, proposed changes to our transparency guidelines or confidentiality guidelines. We've had a number of discussions with the industry liaison forum and some individual manufacturers. We do appreciate the fact that industry has concerns related to some of the changes that we are looking to introduce. And there were some concerns about whether that could impact the percent of uh, submissions that are provided at a pre-NOC stage. I think it's important for both Cadith and the manufacturer that we try to maintain that level and increase it because it does reduce the gaps between Health Canada's NOC um, uh, decision and our uh, recommendations coming out of the expert committee. So that minimizes the gap between those two uh, points. And this isn't really just CADF that's dealing with transparency issues. I think almost every HTA body is looking at making some changes to help increase and enhance the level of transparency within the work that they do. We've seen a fair bit happening on the regulatory side. And I think you'll see over the coming years, uh, significant changes related to the HTA work. And all of this really is to support the evidence that is used uh, to inform our decisions and for us to be very clear about why it is that we've made the recommendations that we've made. What we're looking at for disclosure is that all clinical data, indirect comparisons, prices that are public prices, not, sorry, um, not any negotiated prices, we don't have access to that information to begin with, our economic methods and the outputs to all be disclosed. And there is some more detailed information that um, will accompany that when we actually do implement uh, the changes. What we will continue to consider confidential is information related to market share, uh, manufacturer specific forecasts related to the product that's under review, any specific implementation plans that are provided uh, to us to deal with um, some of the more complex technologies, as well as any data that uh, meets Health Canada's uh, definition of confidential business information. Next slide, please. So in the interim, uh, because we, we did receive some very substantial feedback on transparency, and so thank you very much to everybody who did provide feedback. We have been following up on a number of points that have been raised uh, within those submissions and recognize that we wouldn't be able to implement uh, the changes at the same time that we were implementing some of the more procedural or operational changes related to the drug review program. So in the interim, what we have done is adopted the guidelines that have been used for the non-oncology review products. Um, and uh, following through on that process as the interim step. Uh, redactions will occur after the reports have been drafted. And, but I really wanna emphasize that we are still very much committed to enhancing transparency and we will be making changes to how we process the redactions and minimizing the amount of information that is redacted uh, within the reports. We will continue to discuss some of the options with industry. As I said, we um, have taken the feedback and have a lot of discussions internally and with some of our uh, partners to understand the implication of disclosing certain pieces of information such as, the, for example, the pharmacoeconomic price um, which was highlighted as a key concern uh, in the manufacturer uh, submissions to our consultations. So we are seriously looking at the, those impacts and seeing what can be done. Uh, I suspect at some point there will be minimal redactions to deal with some of those issues as we had identified as continuing to be confidential, but we're also hoping that that will be to a minimum as much as possible as well. 
So on uh, the next slide, I will hand this over to Trevor to provide an update on the pharmaceutical review program. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so I'll provide an update on some of the changes to the drug review programs at Cadeth. Uh, a lot of these really have uh, been shared in various forums and through various other vehicles previously. So not too many surprises to most people, uh, but hope to, to bring everyone at least up to speed um, as to where we are uh, right now. So we can move to the next slide. And the next. So in terms of committee updates, uh, as you know, we, we have regular calls for nominations for committee members whose terms uh, are set to expire to fill those positions um, according to our uh, standard procedures there. So just in terms of an update, in terms of changes to the committees, uh, we'd like to thank um, two outgoing members, one from CDEC and one from PERC. Uh, that is Rakesh Patel uh, for the former and uh, Clay Charbonneau for the latter. And uh, we are looking to fill those positions and we'll make an announcement in the, the coming weeks as to uh, who will be replacing those two individuals. Uh, so thanks again for their uh, exceptional contributions over the last couple of years to those committees. Uh, we have uh, appointed uh, several new committee members uh, to uh, PERC and CDAC. Uh, notable uh, is the, the first appointments of uh, specifically ethicists to CDAC and PERC. So Sally Bean is the ethicist um, uh, from Sunnybrook who will be sitting on CDAC. Um, and Jennifer Bell is uh, the, her counterpart um, uh, taking the ethicist role uh, for PERC for oncology reviews, and she's uh, a bioethicist from UHN. And then uh, Dr. Andrew Shi and Dr. Irene Sadek are respectively two additional members who have been added um, to the CDEC committee to essentially staff a new subcommittee of CDEC, which is, the, uh, which is called CPEC, or the Plasma Expert Committee. And these two individuals um, have extensive experience uh, in hematology and are specifically uh, being appointed, have been appointed to assist with recommendations related to our new uh, process for reviewing uh, plasma related uh, drug products. We can move on. So just uh, this information is available on our website, uh, but just uh, to give you an idea of who the committee members are, uh, so on the left, CDEC and CPEC. Uh, Jim Silvius of note is the chair of that committee. Um, CPEC, as I mentioned, uh, really comprises the addition of the two hematology experts. And PERC, uh, the chair there remains uh, Dr. Maureen Trudeau. And uh, obviously just to reinforce in case you weren't aware that uh, PERC is, uh, the remit for that committee is focused on oncology reviews. Uh, whereas CDEC um, focuses essentially on everything that's uh, not oncology. We can move on. So of note, um, we had we will be changing the, uh, the the meeting timings in terms of when CDEC and PERC meet. Uh, typically, historically. Um, both expert committees have met in the same week. In fact, uh, on consecutive days, the first Wednesday and Thursday of every month, uh, respectively, for CDEC and PERC. Uh, from April of next year, though, we will stagger these meetings such that there will be uh, a week between the two expert committee meetings. Uh, so PERC and CDEC will now be staggered uh, by a week so a variety of reasons for this, um, but really it, it's allowing us, it does allow us to, to make better use of our uh, resources uh, and meet some of the, the substantial challenges um, that we run into when uh, these, these expert meetings uh, run for, for instance, more than one day, um, there, there tends to be overlap. Um, and obviously you can imagine um, it's not an ideal situation. So just of note that we will be staggering the, the committee meetings um, uh, starting in April of 2021. We can go to the next slide. 
So we've talked a lot about alignment over probably in excess of the last year. Uh, we have, uh, as of October, uh, officially launched our uh, harmonized or aligned review process. And I'll just cover some of the highlights um, in terms of changes to that process in the next few slides. Can we go to the next slide. So just a little recap of, of how we got here um, in terms of harmonizing uh, the CADETH drug review processes for reimbursement reviews. Uh, consultations, as you're probably aware, were uh, essentially open uh, from June uh, of this year, June 25 to August 10th. Uh, we received um, well over 80 uh, responses in terms of feedback from a variety of uh, organizations uh, and individuals from patients to public payers and industry and consultants. Uh, we obviously took uh, our time to consider all the feedback, the, the considerable amount of feedback, uh, before finalizing exactly um, which are our proposed changes we would go ahead uh, and implement. Brent already covered uh, the transparency changes, so I won't go into those. Um, but essentially, the, the new aligned procedure for uh, reviewing uh, drugs for reimbursement recommendations um, was implemented uh, in late October. Uh, we did communicate this preceding that uh, on September 30th. And uh, I think of note is that uh, reviews that have been received after uh, the October launch date uh, will reach the expert committees um, for recommendations to be delivered uh, following the April uh, 2021 uh, expert committee meetings. We go to the next slide. So another change is um, that we have consolidated all of our various um, communications related to reimbursement reviews. Uh, so rather than having to subscribe and receive multiple uh, email communications related to various aspects of the programs and specific reviews, we're now consolidating everything into a, a master communication, if you like, that will include um, essentially the following information. It's on the slide, uh, but really of note, uh, open calls for uh, opportunities to provide uh, input and, and participate in the reviews for uh, patient groups and clinician groups, uh, calls for stakeholder feedback on draft recommendations and provisional algorithms, also notice of our final recommendations and algorithms as those are made available, and then we'll include um, major uh, updates to the program in terms of announcements within that communication as well. Um, I believe there's no action needed from anyone that has subscribed to any one of our um, communication vehicles. We will have transitioned to you uh, without having uh, you to have you resubscribe uh, to the new updates. If there are any issues, then please reach out uh, to myself or the rest of my team. We can move on. So following the same vein in terms of harmonization, we are consolidating our web pages. I know this will be good news for a small number of folks that uh, uh, rely, uh, rely on this information and uh, have had uh, the challenge of navigating our various um, portals and web pages to access this. We are consolidating all of this uh, now. Uh, this is uh, imminent, um, but you can look forward to all of our reimbursement reviews being presented on a common web page or portal. Uh, some key changes, they're summarized there, but we will have a single summary table for all of our reimbursement reviews. This will not be split uh, any longer between PCODER and CDR, for instance. Also, it'll con contain all the information you need for any of our reviews that are uh, being conducted. Uh, again, uh, sort of one-stop shopping, if you like as well as opportunities for stakeholder input and feedback. We also will have all of the latest uh, templates that um, you could use for the various parts of the procedure and process made available on the consolidated web pages, as well as uh, publishing our meeting schedules for the expert committees. We can move to the next slide, thanks. So just an update on the clinician engagement process. 
Um, just to recap where we do use uh, political experts in our review processes. We do engage multiple experts on each of our reviews. Um, they, as noted on the slide, they provide uh, various forms of input, but particularly advise on our research protocols, uh, helping with uh, appraisal of clinical evidence, interpretation of that evidence, and probably most importantly, uh, helping to illuminate uh, the place in therapy. We also have expanded um, uh, clinician uh, engagement to establish uh, clinician panels for uh, complex reviews, uh, where we uh, expand upon the, the core expert pool that's retained for each review to include multiple other experts um, to advise again on, on placement therapy and, and unmet needs and really anything uh, that, that uh, is related to the review that requires expert input. Uh, we we uh, have the, the, the panel process established and where possible, in fact, have uh, aligned that process with um, our counterparts at INES so that we're able to, uh, in most cases, um, hold uh, joint uh, clinical panels for engaging uh, pan-Canadian experts uh, together with INES. We also have now expanded um, the ability for clinician groups to provide input and feedback into all of our reviews going forward. So this was previously in, in place for uh, the P-coder or oncology reviews, um, but we now have expanded this uh, to allow um, input from any clinician group for any product. Um, and we'll, it will also be expanded to allow this for draft recommendations going forward as well, which is new. We can move on. Just a little bit more on the clinician input process. I know this, this has uh, been the subject of some discussion and questions, so hoping to provide, provide some more clarity on this. Uh, previously for the oncology review process, um, individual clinicians were uh, able to provide their input. Um, because we've expanded this to um, all of our reviews at CADF uh, for reimbursement uh, reviews, um, the, the volume is substantially greater. And we'd like to, uh, we've essentially harmonized uh, the process for um, dealing with clinician input, such as we're focusing on um, asking for that in input to be provided by uh, groups of clinicians or associations uh, rather than individuals. Um, so we're encouraging cl individual clinicians to work together with their peers uh, to provide joint submissions, which will uh, not only improve the quality, but it'll, it'll reduce redundancy um, and uh, you know, of note the administrative burden uh, uh, for the CADF team in, in dealing with that volume of input. So really we've, uh, the, the core message here is that we've taken um, what was a very popular process uh, at PCODER and now expanded that, uh, as I said, to all uh, reimbursement reviews at CADF and are, are very pleased to, to offer that ability uh, for, for any clinician to provide input um, into any review. Uh, as I said, important is, is to encourage them to work uh, together to be uh, more efficient and therefore more effective in providing that input as a group. We can move on. A little bit about sponsor engagement, just to recap where we are with that. Sponsors will have the opportunity to review and comment on the draft reports, those are the clinical and economic reports for reimbursement reviews prior to the committee meeting. So this will be something that is new on the oncology side. So we're very pleased to be able to provide um, an opportunity that has been in place for the non-oncology reviews um, to all reviews essentially now for reimbursement uh, recommendations at CADF. Uh, so sponsors will uh, have an opportunity to provide comments during uh, the review process. And uh, as you know, uh, we will uh, continue with our process of um, providing uh, written responses uh, to those to that input. Uh, of note, checkpoint meetings uh, from the PICO process, uh, because of the, this and some other changes, are really 
uh, no longer relevant. Uh, we've replaced those checkpoint meetings with more rapid ad hoc communications uh, directly between ourselves and the sponsors to clarify issues during the review rather than waiting for uh, one point in the review. Um, also having provided clarity on the transparency initiative and, and what is considered confidential and not, this really obviates the, uh, the discussion that uh, usually happened at the checkpoint meetings about uh, disclosure, of, disclosure of information. An important new offering is also the, the ability for uh, sponsors to meet with and discuss uh, requests for reconsiderations of recommendations uh, with CAV. So we can move on. A little bit more about drug plan engagement. So we have made some changes to how we uh, engage with um, the drug plans and cancer agencies to harmonize this across all of our reviews. And really the key there is that we're looking to the drug plans to provide us with um, greater definition on what uh, might be implementation issues for a particular review. Uh, this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but uh, we are harmonizing this process in terms of where we engage with the drug plans and cancer agencies and how that um, information is used in our review process. It will be um, moved to be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it'll, be, it'll be gathered early in the, the review phase so that it is able to inform uh, the entire review. Um, also, this information will be included in the review reports, which, as I said earlier, are made available to the sponsors for their review uh, and feedback. And then this will continue through uh, discussion at the committee meetings and eventually will uh, end up being included explicitly uh, in the recommendations themselves, which again uh, will be provided to sponsors, in fact, uh, publicly to all stakeholders to provide feedback on this and any other information in the recommendation. Uh, there is an implementation phase that, that could be triggered um, to address uh, implementation questions or issues that uh, the committees are unable to address due to limitations uh, that they face you know, being required to essentially base their recommendations on uh, objective evidence. Um, the details are available in our procedures on this, um, but this can be triggered uh, subsequent to a recommendation being issued and will focus on providing uh, implementation related advice to uh, the drug plans and cancer agencies. We can move on. <clears throat> in terms of the clinical review process, the, the top line really says it all. Uh, no major changes to that uh, process. Suffice to say, the harmonized process will mean that the, the key milestones and approach will be the same for all drug review um, uh, drug reviews at CADF or recommendations. Um, so we will continue to do a systematic review as the, the core um, vehicle for assessing evidence uh, on the clinical side, uh, obviously for, for everything except the, the tailored review process. Um, we will, as I said, we have harmonized the, not only the process and procedures related to the reviews it's themselves, but uh, we will have a common template that will be used for all reviews, um, as well as the, the, the same procedures and milestones. So this will hopefully alleviate some of the potential for confusion with uh, multiple processes having been used uh, previously. As I mentioned, a major new um, offering there is the ability for sponsors to review and comment to provide feedback to us uh, on the draft reports. Um, we did discuss um, the potential for, um, you know, uh, aligning with uh, the approach of some other international HDA agencies in, in uh, requesting that the sponsor file the systematic review to CADF. Um, we are still considering how that, that could be implemented. As I said, that's not going to be implemented uh, right now. Um, but uh, just, just bear in mind that if, if this change were to be proposed, we would, of course, um, consult uh, publicly on that before doing anything. And uh, if, if we were to make any changes, um, not only for this, but as, as applies to any changes at the program, 
um, we, we will uh, consult, uh, sorry, notify um, uh, any individual uh, organizations or stakeholders well in advance uh, of launching anything to allow for, for adequate preparation. So we can move on. So an update on the economic uh, review process. Um, so of note here is the, the, the change to um, reintroduce the ability for sponsors to file cost minimization analyses or CMAs for certain submissions. Um, it, there are a number of reasons for bringing this back, uh, including efficiency and aligning uh, with uh, the approach of other HTA agencies. Um, and uh, obviously this has been a request uh, from uh, numerous sponsors uh, for some time now. So we're happy to be able to bring this back uh, as an offering for the kind of drug review processes. Reminder, uh, further details on this are available uh, from us uh, on the website and in the procedure document. Um, but just briefly to recap where a CMA would be considered to be an acceptable form of economic analysis. Um, they're summarized on the slide there, but it's essentially where there are other options available and reimbursed uh, by the public payers. Um, that uh, treat the same population as uh, the drug that is being submitted for review. <clears throat> Obviously that, that's the requirement. Uh, the second, I think is probably the key requirement and uh, it's probably the, the most uh, difficult to get clarity on. However, um, for a CMA, obviously a requirement would be that uh, the new product is at least as clinically effective uh, as the comparators, uh, whether that's based on ideally direct um, or, or indirect evidence, um, that has to be a requirement that's, that's demonstrated as well. And then finally, um, in terms of a CMA, uh, the, the new product would need to demonstrate that um, they're not increasing the cost burden, burden to the public payers, um, as well as uh, I think going further than that, it, it demonstrating cost savings would make a compelling case for a CMA. So I think the top line is, is what I left uh, to last. Um, so while we're offering the opportunity to accept a, a CMA where these conditions are met, um, uh, you can appreciate that um, uh, it's, it's impossible to definitively determine whether all of these conditions have been met until you actually finished our review process. So it's, it's really incumbent on a sponsor to provide enough information um, to allow us to determine uh, that these conditions have been met during the review process. <clears throat> and uh, ultimately the decision of whether to do cost minimization uh, versus a cost utility analysis is at the discretion of the sponsor. Uh, the top bullet again, uh, our position is that um, the cost utility analysis or the, the CUA remains uh, CATA's preferred form of economic analysis. And we would never uh, not accept a cost utility analysis, even where a CMA that may be appropriate. We can move on. So in terms of recommendations and the format uh, uh, in the context of uh, harmonization or alignment, we will continue to use the recommendation framework that um, has been in place um, and in fact is uh, common to all of our drug review committees for, for some years now. Um, in the interim, um, Nicole Mittman and her team uh, are working on potentially updating uh, the deliberative process to harmonize this for uh, the drug review uh, committees. Um, and uh, as this develops, we will, of course, uh, provide information uh, publicly on potentially any changes to that. Um, it's really status quo right now in terms of how we proceed uh, with uh, the proviso that there might be some changes in terms um, of the logistics uh, to harmonize uh, the committee uh, functioning. Um, I guess in terms of the recommendations themselves, so Randy will present um, some updates to, to the, uh, the products that we produce um, in terms of the format of those, as well as presenting some, some new products. In terms of the recommendation formats, 
as I mentioned, the aligned reviews or the harmonized uh, process will have its first uh, recommendations being generated after the April 2021 expert meetings. And from that time, um, you will notice that the format of the recommendations will change uh, for, for all of our expert committees. Um, some will be uh, a more dramatic change than others, um, but the key is that the, the format will be the same and it'll really borrow on uh, two of the, the strengths of C, uh, CDR and PCODE respectively, um, summarized on the slide there, but uh, we will uh, have a new format for presenting um, conditions and reasons or the rationale for those conditions for individual recommendations um, in a consistent and clear manner. Um, kind of in the way that you see those recommendations coming out from CDEC right now, that'll be applied uh, across the board for all of our reviews, including oncology reviews. We also will be uh, updating the format to provide a greater, greater clarity, um, so greater emphasis uh, on uh, potential implementation issues. I touched on this earlier, but those will be clarified and highlighted uh, distinctly in our recommendations going forward from April. And this really is, is building on um, experience uh, uh, in this realm uh, built through the, the P-coder process through PERC. We can move on. I mentioned this earlier, but just to re-emphasize that uh, this, this is new for us, um, but we're, we're very pleased to be able to uh, offer the opportunity for stakeholders to uh, review and provide feedback on draft recommendations going forward uh, from April. So all of our draft recommendations will be posted for stakeholder feedback publicly uh, in the interest of transparency. Um, because we still have uh, the confidentiality issue to deal with, um, we still will provide uh, the sponsors, uh, certainly, uh, as well as the drug programs and cancer agencies with the unredacted versions of those recommendations. Um, but we will uh, unfortunately have to post uh, redacted versions for uh, uh, public feedback. We can move on actually. Uh, so updates in terms of reconsideration op uh, options. Uh, again, more details, we've shared this information uh, previously and, and more details are available uh, through the website and the procedures. But just to recap uh, what the reconsiderations are, um, I think the, the main issue here was to, to harmonize the processes and, and at the same time modernize them to allow some greater flexibility uh, and efficiency uh, uh, in terms of particularly uh, avoiding uh, potentially lengthy delays uh, for anything that's being uh, considered for reconsideration through the expert committees. So going forward, we will essentially stratify reconsiderations into three major buckets or categories. Um, major revisions uh, will be those revisions that could, uh, I think the easiest example there is, uh, is, is imagining a reconsideration in fact, change the recommendation from um, a negative to a positive recommendation. To, so essentially to change the, the category of recommendation that would be considered a major revision. Uh, minor revisions are really any revisions to the conditions or anything related to the recommendation that's not going to change either the, the category of recommendation or substantially change um, the population that, that would be eligible for reimbursement, those would be minor revisions. And then editorial revisions are, uh, as um, the name implies, really minor edits to improve uh, clarity or correct uh, factual errors. Um, so uh, these were developed over some time and really uh, did leverage some of the feedback we've had, um, particularly from sponsors in, in terms of how we could uh, improve this process. Go to the next slide, please. So uh, these, this just uh, clarifies the differences between major and minor revisions. Uh, without going into uh, even more detail, I think just to highlight that um, the timelines here are for major revisions. We anticipate um, uh, most of the re re reconsiderations will be able to be dealt with either through 
just making editorial re revisions, which will not need to go back to the expert committee and will be dealt with um, in an expeditious fashion, or minor revisions, which uh, ideally we're targeting not taking more than one month to finalize those. And that is because um, this will be able to uh, be resolved through a sub panel of the expert committee rather than uh, waiting to convene the full committee. As mentioned, the, the major revisions will require um, a, a full committee meeting and uh, as per our usual process, will still take between two and three months uh, to allow for uh, the engagement uh, and background work that needs to be done prior to that meeting. Of note, uh, eligibility for the major revisions and minor revisions is being limited uh, to the sponsors and plans. Uh, right now, considering the potential impacts uh, in terms of timelines and delays to access there. Um, of note, though, we will, as I mentioned earlier, uh, regardless uh, of um, what type of uh, reconsideration might be requ requested, uh, all stakeholders uh, will still be provided an opportunity to provide their feedback on a draft recommendation. So we can move on. So just a couple of reminders. Uh, these are, are just uh, based on some of the experiences we've had over the last uh, few months, and uh, just in the interest of allowing the, the process to operate uh, more efficiently and more, more effectively. Uh, we're open to um, addressing any inquiries, um, but just remind uh, anyone that's interested in inquiry to, to please provide as much detail as possible. Um, we do have standardized templates and processes uh, to assist with providing this information, but it, it typically does avoid any delays uh, in, in really dealing with inquiries effectively if you provide as much information as possible. Uh, you know, for instance, hypotheticals are, are really difficult to, to deal with, so we really do require as much detail uh, as possible to allow us to, to sort out uh, any issues related to inquiries uh, quickly. We have noticed that uh, um, sponsors have on occasion included disclaimers that have essentially prevented us sharing information that's provided to us with some of our key stakeholders, including uh, the drug plans. So uh, rather than um, uh, having us try to resolve these on an ad hoc basis, which uh, takes considerable time and resources, we just ask uh, sponsors to please uh, not include uh, this kind of disclaimer on any of the material they're submitting to us going forward. Reminded to consultants to please um, include uh, contacts from the manufacturer or sponsor on all your correspondence. Again, this is just going to make things operate uh, more smoothly and avoid potential delays. Um, uh, so please include uh, any sponsor or manufacturer in, in all of your correspondence rather than relying on, on us to do that. Um, tracking uh, the request at cath.ca, hopefully that's all in, uh, that's in, in everyone's contact list, but uh, whether you're contacting myself or Brent or Suzanne or really anyone in our program uh, with a question or a query, it, it's always um, advisable to copy a request at cath to ensure that uh, your, your message is not, um, doesn't fall through the cracks and we can uh, deal with it uh, in a, an efficient way and avoid any delays there. And then finally, um, perennial uh, reminder, but again, please um, always uh, source your, your templates from our website. We're constantly uh, updating our templates um, and uh, the latest version will all be uh, always be available on our website um, for download. So uh, please rely on these rather than uh, saving them uh, or sourcing them from uh, any other um, source. We can move on. So if you're still awake, we could cover some other initiatives um, by way of uh, reminder and update. So we can move on to the next slide. I'll just take a sip of my own coffee. So the provisional algorithm process, um, you may recall that um, uh, the CDIC um, uh, process um, on the oncology side was transitioned to CADF uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, we have 
integrated that into our, our program and review processes to establish, as I mentioned earlier, implementation panels to address implementation related issues. Um, but really a unique um, feature of the, the oncology um, side of things uh, has been the need for uh, development of treatment algorithms uh, or aka sequencing algorithms. Um, so we have established a, a process for, for essentially doing that, providing advice uh, on sequencing uh, in terms of um, algorithms. We're pleased to uh, um, be able to offer, uh, as we, we try to do with all of our processes, um, the ability for uh, stakeholders to provide input into that process. So this is, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to uh, provide this um, in terms of uh, meeting our transparency objectives and being inclusive and, and fair. Um, to, so uh, any algorithm uh, that is being developed will be publicly announced and uh, will have an opportunity for all stakeholders um, to provide input, including patient uh, clinician groups, as well as uh, notably uh, any other um, manufacturers that might be impacted by said algorithm. We can move on. <clears throat> so the title is Mandatory Information Sharing. I think that's because this is top of mind, but really the, the context here is our aligned reviews. We've spoken about this numerous times in multiple forums. So I won't recap uh, the, the aligned review process, but just related to um, our, uh, our commitment to um, evaluate and potentially update that process after it was launched and put in place uh, approximately a year ago. Um, just a reminder, this allows for parallel reviews um, of products through um, uh, a collaboration between Health Canada, uh, Cadath, and Ines. Uh, we did a consultation to um, get input on a, a couple of proposals, most notably uh, the proposal to move from this being a opt-in or voluntary uh, participation to being mandatory in terms of specifically um, sharing information um, between Health Canada Cadeth and Ines, if you opt into the aligned review uh, pre NOC submission process, as well as the uh, proposal to make some minor revisions to the cons consult, so, sorry, to the consent consent letter, and the logistics related to that. Uh, really, no no major issues with that part of it. We can move on. Um, so feedback that we had in terms of a proposal to make information sharing mandatory um, if you're participating in the pre noc aligned review process. Um, generally, uh, there was really positive feedback in terms of this proposal. And in fact, uh, um, numerous stakeholders expressed surprise that this wasn't in fact mandatory and hadn't realized that that was uh, the case. Um, industry has raised a number of concerns though. Uh, they're, they're outlined on the slides there. <clears throat> without going into too much detail, um, uh, they really center around, um, you know, caution around uh, what information is shared and how that information is used. Um, and I think uh, there's a persistent um, lack of uh, a clear benefit to the sponsors that uh, I think outweighs their, their view of the potential risk of uh, sharing this information uh, between uh, these uh, our three uh, organizations. So we can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so for right now, it, it's status quo. We are still considering the feedback and figuring out how we will move ahead um, following the consultation. Uh, suffice to say, if we do uh, move ahead with changes to, um, to the process, um, we will, uh, provide uh, ample notification um, to all stakeholders prior to uh, going ahead with, with any implementation. As I said, uh, what exactly might change is still to be determined. Um, and we look, we're looking for a lead time of at least six months um, uh, should any changes uh, be proposed to go ahead. So we can go ahead. 
Uh, so changes to pre-submission meetings. Um, again, this is not new information, but just to recap that we are um, including drug programs and cancer agencies as observers um, in our pre-submission meetings uh, that occur between CADETH staff and sponsors. Um, of note, uh, we've had some issues trying to share the information that's uh, discussed at these meetings with all the participants, including the drug programs. Um, so we will be revising our, uh, uh, the, the forms associated with that essentially to um, provide some, some upfront consent to allow us to, to share information with the drug programs rather than us doing, uh, dealing with these um, on an ad hoc basis. Uh, we hope to have that uh, in place uh, from uh, December of this year. So we can move on. So I think that's it for me. Um, Brent, can I hand it back to you? Sure. Uh, next slide, please. So I will be um, passing it along to Nicole Mittman, who will be talking about some of the pieces that Trevor had mentioned around the deliberation um, process uh, for our expert committees, as well as uh, an update on real world evidence and scientific advice. So over to you, Nicole. Thanks very much, Brent. Next slide, please. So just to provide a, an update on, uh, we approached or we introduced this topic at the last uh, forum about a year ago, uh, where we wanted to address some of the potential uh, consistencies or standardize and really harmonize the three expert review committees that we have. So you are all with respect to this audience, familiar with PERC and CDEC, but we also have our health technology expert review panel for medical devices and clinical interventions. All three panels or expert committees have evolved uh, over time with different uh, kinds of competencies uh, with respect to expertise and processes. And then also, for example, with some of the in information that they actually deliberate on. So here was an opportunity along with the alignment process to think about how we deliberate here at CADETH and provide some sort of uh, consistency around those and provide some uh, guidance and potentially some recommendations on how we can harmonize. Uh, and so the, the idea was to harmonize and then potentially enhance those committees where if there are recommendations in order to improve the way we deliberate here at CADIS that we could enhance some of those committees. Next slide, please. So the, the three kinds of, uh, or the, the work that we uh, undertook was to conduct an environmental scan of what are best practices amongst other health technology agencies and how they deliberate. What we quickly found was that there isn't any best practice, but there are different perspectives and different ways that different health technology agencies actually conduct their deliberation. So what we wanted to do was go back to first principles and review what are, what are the, what's the conceptual evidence on deliberative frameworks and processes. And as a reminder, there are really two kinds of pieces of information that we're looking at. We have the framework itself on what information do we use to make decisions on. Uh, and then there's the process in terms of either membership or order or the way uh, the way the voting happens. So we wanted to go back to sort of first principles and look at the con the concepts of how that actual evidence gets into the frameworks and the processes. We also started to review and summarize some of the key recommendations um, that we have found through our environmental scan. We also did a little bit of a quality assessment of our, our with our panels, our three committees, our expert committees with respect to how they uh, look at information, how they uh, understand transparency, how they understand how information has an impact. And, we, and together we worked with the Center for Innovations in Regulatory Sciences or CIRS to help us with a quality assessment of that work. Uh, and then we also looked at um, taking that information back to put together a draft set of recommendations for the committee based on not only our environmental scan, but also then the quality assessment. Next slide, please. 
So we also reached out to uh, with some stakeholder feedback uh, and really tried to understand that uh, we've heard that even just understanding what does the deliberative process mean, uh, what are frameworks and providing some sort of concepts on that. Uh, and really, uh, as, as Trevor already mentioned, in terms of transparency. So how do we deliberate? Uh, how, are, how, how are decisions being made? What information is presented? Is some of it implicit versus explicit? And some of the stakeholder feedback that we've received has actually highlighted the need for more transparency. And so again, highlighting that from a framework point of view, uh, do we need to be explicit with the criteria that we look at in terms of value assessments or understand how that information is interpreted and rationalized and used in the decision-making process? And then from a process, you know, understanding what are the key drivers in a recommendation, how are the, the process by which information is provided to the expert committees, also the order potentially of the, process, the way that the information is provided, and thinking about any sort of uh, considerations along the way of a process that could be harmonized amongst the three committees. Next slide, please. So we're, we are at a, a point where we have taken all the information from the environmental scan, we've taken some initial stakeholder feedback, and we're now at the stage where we're thinking about consultation. Uh, and starting to think a little bit around how do we consider stakeholder uh, sponsor feedback in, uh, in the way that we deliberate or provide uh, our, our decisions. And so our first uh, model for consultation will be actually be uh, with our patient groups. And uh, we're just in the process of trying to understand how we can model that well. Uh, and the idea would be to provide some education sessions around improving the transparency of what deliberation is, and then also having an opportunity to discuss how patient input is actually uh, achieved uh, or what kind of information would patients like to see in our alignment process or in our deliberation process. And then we are looking for other opportunities for consultation amongst our stakeholders and our sponsors. Uh, this again will facilitate greater transparency and understanding of deliberation. And then uh, we will contribute to uh, the uh, informed approach to harmonizing and consistency of the way that we do things in expert committees. Next step, please. So that's deliberation. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about real world evidence and this is a real uh, topic near and dear to my heart. Next uh, slide, please. So this work was launched uh, initially or at the Canadian Association for Population Therapeutics in 2018, where the real world evidence core action team RWE CAT was formed. Uh, there are a number of members that part of that, including CADF, Health Canada, Ines, CIHR, Chi High, and then also some academics and some industry members are part of this core action team. Uh, at, after the, this uh, uh, sort of, uh, initiative was launched in 2018, there have been a number of deliverables and, and a couple of uh, publications, uh, either in a peer reviewed format and a white paper, talking about the process and what is needed to actually think about uh, real world evidence in the space of health technology assessment. Next slide, please. So uh, the core action team has been very busy of late. Uh, we, and here's the membership again. Uh, and we have, uh, through a survey of the membership, we have actually identified that there are three areas that we need to have fo uh, focus on. And those would be guidance. Uh, and then there is around real world evidence around oncology products and real world evidence around non-oncology products. And that would be in the drug space. And I have very uh, grayed out uh, because this has not a, yet a, a working group uh, committee, but perhaps even thinking about a non-oncology in the uh, working group in the uh, device space as well. So we are in the process of putting together our terms of reference and what are the scope of activities within th each of those working groups. Each of those groups have uh, co-chairs, uh, a CADF member and a Health Canada member. Uh, and part of the work that folks are trying to look at are what will the, the activities be uh, under the working groups that will move beyond necessarily the membership for the core action team. 
Uh, we are in the process of understanding what is an inventory of databases. So where does RWE lie and strategies around Canada to access RWE? Uh, we're certainly trying to think a little bit around improving the dialogue between uh, sponsors or manufacturers uh, and, uh, and health technology agencies uh, and every health technology agency we've been in touch with has similar issues around how do we look at RWE and certainly how do we uh, incorporate RWE into the health technology assessments that we do. Uh, and we're also trying to build criteria uh, for and for choosing RWE demonstration projects and that will be part of the terms of reference and the mandate of each of the working groups is to think about how do we demonstrate that we can use RWE for either uh, our deliberations, for potentially our submissions, uh, for potentially looking at the way we continue evidence generation. So uh, part of starting to look at how do we uh, choose demonstration projects and what criteria are important to do that. Uh, as well. And then all the while being cognizant of the fact that this is a similar problem through Health Canada, and they're also dealing with issues of how do we look at real world evidence for diseases that might not have formal or robust clinical trial programs, such as rare diseases or pediatric populations. Uh, and so making sure that we're always in alignment with uh, Health Canada and some of the methods, for example, or some of the submission requirements that they need as well. And then are there optimal time points for the use or for the, the information around RWE? So is it at submission? Is it at uh, consideration? Is it after consideration? So thinking about different ways that that, would be, that work would continue. And certainly uh, groups like the Institute for Health Economics have actually started to look at that of, of, in terms of rare diseases. Next slide, please. So here's an opportunity where we're, while we're considering and doing the work with the RWE CAT, um, there's also a bigger program around RWE that we're starting to think about here at CADF. Uh, and they're really kind of four objectives or four broad objectives around how do we provide guidance? So what kind of evidence is required? And for those of you who have submitted, you know that we already do accept real world evidence in our submissions, usually for I mean, quality of life information may come from real world evidence, utilization information may come from real world evidence, uh, certainly health preference data could come from real world evidence. Um, I think that the sticking point for all health technology agencies and regulatory agencies are around how do we look at the efficacy piece or the effectiveness piece and can we use real world evidence to actually support some of those outcome data. You know, certainly we use real world evidence from registries from safety data. So, you know, it's really the sticking point is around some of the efficacy and some of the evaluations around that. So can we provide some guidance around that? Uh, so we're looking for opportunities there. Uh, what kind of advice can we provide? And uh, we, you know, we have guidelines for economic evaluations. Are, is there an opportunity to provide guidance on submissions or potentially RWE at, uh, from an advice level? The evaluation already alluded to the fact that the sticky point is really around the efficacy or the effectiveness piece. So are there methodological requirements that we're looking for, or are there requirements around the data that is actually being used and potentially submitted? Uh, so example is, you know, how independent was it? Um, who did the analysis? And those are all things that are actually inborn to a randomized clinical trial program, but may not be so much uh, uh, articulated or or thought of in potentially real world evidence or registries or cohort studies. So starting to think a little bit around how do we evaluate the quality of the real world evidence that's uh, received and then working with other groups. So there are lots of groups with industry who have also created registries or patient assistance programs. Um, also thinking about academic groups, there are at registries, there are uh, administrative databases, there are academic groups such as DSEN uh, and uh, other groups across the country that actually have done this for a number of years. So can we collaborate with them and what kind of information do we need in terms of access or uh, availability of the data to help us answer some of those questions? And also just to what, what is the uncertainty we're trying to address. So what methodological uh, rigor do we need around that as well? Next slide, please. So scientific advice, um, next slide. 
After a pause during COVID, we are open for business again, and we have a number of uh, projects already under review through, through our scientific advice program. So um, if folks are really interested in being part of our scientific advice program, where we could provide scientific advice on the clinical trial program, we can do that as CADETH alone, but we also have partnerships with Health Canada, where you provide the, uh, the advice from not only a regulatory point of view, but from a health technology point of view. And we've had a number of projects that we've worked on with NICE as well in collaboration as well. So if, if, in, if interested, our program is open for business. And with that, that's my last slide. Thank you. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, I think maybe one of the positive outputs, if you can say that, related to COVID-19 is the fact that it's really challenging the status quo. And similarly, that is also affecting how we've been doing some of our reviews and responding to questions related to COVID-19. And Heather will uh, provide an update on some of the activities that CADETH is doing related to COVID-19 treatments. Heather? Terrific, thanks very much, Brent. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining today. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of some of the work we've been doing. The teams internally have been working hard since we launched our COVID-19 effort in April. Um, so this data is really until uh, the end of October. So we have a mechanism on our new COVID microsite to uh, enable people in the external environment to submit requests to let us know how CADF can best use its core competencies uh, and products and services to support um, decision making and the information needs uh, during such an unprecedented time. We've had now more than 190 requests literally from every jurisdiction across the country, including some from international. Uh, we On our new website, uh, we've had uh, about 37,000 uh, hits on the website, a little bit increased from what's on this slide. And we focused the site based on uh, themes, so treatment, infection, prevention, control, screening, testing, um, et cetera. And of those, we have both reactive topics, uh, so where people like you have come and said, please help us understand what the evidence uh, is on this particular topic. But the team, because they are always monitoring the external environment, also proactively identify things. And there really is a mix of those on the site. Um, so some of the most interesting topics or I guess downloaded topics and documents on our site include N95 reprocessing, um, the remdesivir report, including the implementation advice panel that we hosted. Um, so there's a large number of them online and I invite you to go to the site to take a look. As part of uh, our commitment to bringing evidence to decision makers and customers, we have instituted a series of webinars. And so what you'll see in the middle column are the lists um, of, and apologies for the formatting, a list of some of the webinars that we've hosted. Uh, the most uh, current one is happening next week and it's on community transmission in heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. Um, with experts uh, from a technical perspective, as well as uh, biological and some of the epidemiology. So we've had more than 10,000 um, combined uh, views, either in the webinar or in the YouTube. They're all posted on YouTube and available after the fact. Uh, from 46 countries in the top five are Canada, the US, the UK, Brazil, and Chile. Uh, those numbers really haven't, uh, the countries haven't changed, uh, but the numbers continue to go up. And I expect next week's will be very popular. Lots of global reach given the where people are coming from to access the information and lots and lots of collaboration. I think that's one of the biggest learnings that we've had is the need to connect with people who are doing their best to similarly respond to requests in the environment to avoid duplication of effort and really build synergy into the system. So it has been a whole of organization approach and we hope you find the information valuable. As Brent mentioned, one of the things that we introduced into this process, which is specific to the COVID-19 effort, is either a living or more preferably evergreen documents. So evergreen documents are those that need to be regularly updated um, because there's a change, uh, expected quick change in the evidence. Um, so we will, uh, it, there are parameters that are established up front, documents are released, um, and then there are regular um, alerts that come into the organization when pivotal or new information becomes available. So the team can act on that quickly, revise documentation and repost it. And so we have a small number of them. They do take an, uh, a different level of effort than a normal one-off review. I think we've had eight in total and four of them are ongoing. So where we believe there's 
pivotal or new evidence that decision makers would need to have, we will have a discussion to determine whether it should be an evergreen document and set up the right parameters to do that. So this is specific again to the COVID-19 effort given how quickly evidence is changing, but we're learning a lot from that experience and uh, you know, we'll continue to do that where it adds value for COVID-19. I think that's all I had, Brent, so I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Great, thanks, Heather. Um, before we jump into the patient engagement discussions, uh, we're going to take just a quick break uh, just to uh, people have been sitting for an extended period of time and there's been a lot of information. Um, certainly during this break, you can add more questions into the Q&A box um, on the panel there. And I would suggest that uh, given the current timing, if people could come in just before 11 o'clock, and we will restart the presentations exact right at uh, 11. So thank you very much. I think we will um, um, close down uh, our videos uh, so you won't see any of our faces, uh, but we'll keep the slide up for now. Thank you. this session. I'm going to hand this over to Sarah Berglis to talk about the patient engagement process that CADETH related to our drug reviews. Sarah? Thank you, Brent. Next slide. So to begin, I really wanted to thank all of the patient groups and individuals who contributed feedback during our consultation on the reimbursement review process. So of the 80 or so responses that we received, more than half came from patient groups and patients. So a really big thank you. Next slide. So Trevor walked us through the aligned process, highlighting some of the kind of key elements and uh, changes. I just wanna highlight a new resource to support um, the aligned process. It's fresh on our website. Um, and it helps patient groups to contribute uh, to our reviews. Many of the new elements that are in this guidance specifically address the questions and concerns that patient groups raised during the consultation. Next slide. So I'll let you read through this slide. Um, there are just three ideas that I wanna highlight here. The first is in terms of the impact of patient input. So in the guidance, we describe uh, why patient input is valued and what it contributes to our drug reviews. We provide real examples of how responses to each of the template prompts have been used in our drug reviews. And we're kind of hopeful that it will be a little easier to identify what to include if it can be kind of clearly seen um, how that information is used. Then during the consultation, we did have a few groups um, request to have six months to be able to pro provide a patient input or financial support to be able to do so. Now, CADETH isn't able to accommodate either of these requests. So for now, we clarify in our guidance what we see might be possible to achieve within uh, 35 business days, so sort of seven weeks and offers suggestions as to um, what can be done to try and reduce that resource, um, sorry, response burden. Patient groups contribute a great deal to CADETH, 
um, to ensure that the voice of their membership is heard. Thank you. Next slide. The ideas continue here. Um, so first, I just wanted to highlight um, perhaps it's a little bit of myth busting. The patient's full um, patient input that is provided to CADETH, it goes to the expert committees. It goes to PERC and it goes to CDAC. The summaries that CADETH review staff prepare, they're there to help the team interact with your input and to be able to pull out ideas for the report. Um, the opportunity to be able to provide feedback on draft recommendations was will be happening for all reviews, reimbursement reviews, going to the April committee meetings and moving forward. And this was something that was welcomed in the consultation. Um, and finally, um, a lot of patient groups know me, um, know my team, Tamara, Julie, Kathleen. So really reach out to us anytime with questions and comments. Um, we will use the dialogue from your questions to help us develop the next edition of the guidance. Next slide. And although I've, my last few slides have really been focusing on patient input, I just wanted to underscore that that is one way that uh, CADETH hears patient voices. Um, for example, many patient groups contributed to our wonderful symposium, uh, presenting, uh, preparing posters, reviewing abstracts to help us put together the program. We involve patients in our early scientific advice and in many of our device projects. We also have our patient and community advisory committee that supports CADETH, as well as our wonderful patient and public members um, on our expert committees. And so all of these things really complement the hard work that is being done by patient groups. Um, so if you haven't uh, seen it before, check out our framework um, and our overview of how to get involved. The link is at the bottom of the slide if you haven't seen it already. Uh, thank you. And back to you, Brent. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, and the last presentation before we head into questions is from Randy, who's gonna provide us an update on our communications. Randy. Thank you, Brent, and thank you everybody for attending today. So um, a lot of great questions coming in. I think I am the last presentation before we move to the uh, questions. Uh, and I just wanted to run through some of the changes that are happening on the communications front that uh, we hope are going to simplify uh, CADETH for you. So just to begin with, a caveat, we know that uh, you guys are very busy and that you don't have time to really educate yourself on our rather complex nomenclature, our very unique publishing practices, and really the breadth of what we do. Our reports are long and uh, they can be difficult to identify the key takeaways. And um, monitoring our ad hoc uh, email communications, I think, has also been a burden on a lot of people. So next slide, please. Today, I'm very happy to talk about many of the changes that we are making to help simplify uh, CADETH for customers and stakeholders. So I'll run through each of these uh, relatively quickly, but just to give you a preview, we're shifting from 30 to four product brands. We're gonna be publishing multiple reviews, a single report. We're gonna be inserting key messages and abstracts into all of our reviews and being consistent in supplementing our key projects with a project summary. We're replacing our e-alert notification system with the uh, CADETH weekly summary. And today, I guess I'm officially announcing that we'll be launching the Canadian Journal of Health Technologies in January. So next slide, please. So this is our current branding. Uh, we have more than 34 different product types. And um, I, I assure you that um, uh, there, there are very few people who would be able to identify what each of these different products are. So as you look through, you'll see that uh, uh, this is a combination of drug and medical device uh, products, but there are an awful lot of uh, drug product names on this list. So going forward, next slide. We're going to be simplifying this down to four product uh, brands. So the first is our Cadet Horizon scans. The second is the Cadet reference list. The third is the Cadet reimbursement reviews. And the fourth is the Cadet health technology reviews. I won't go into too much detail on these. Uh, the horizon scans, as you know, are, are reports where we look out onto the horizon and identify new uh, technologies that are coming down the pipe that we need to be aware of. The reference lists 
um, replace what we used to call a rapid response level one and 1.5, and they are reference lists. Uh, the CADIS reimbursement reviews is uh, what I think most of you are uh, quite interested in. This would be our CDR, P-coder, um, plasma products, et cetera. And then the CADIS health technology reviews is uh, the catch-all for what was predominantly our HTA and optimal use uh, portfolio. But over the years that had grown to include probably close to 20 other uh, products. And those will all now be branded as health technology reviews. So moving from 30 to four, we hope will simplify things. Okay, next slide. <laughs> the other thing that uh, we're doing is going to be um, changing the way that we're publishing our reviews. And I've just used an example here from the common drug review, but what we're talking about here will be common across all CADIS products. So currently um, we, we uh, publish our clinical reviews and our pharmacoeconomic reviews for the same drug review as separate reports. Next slide, please. And if you were to go to our website, you would see on the right-hand side that they're actually uh, separate reports. And if you were interested in um, finding out about the full review, you'd have to download, well, first you'd have to know, you'd have to download both and then uh, uh, kind of cobble them together yourself. Next slide. So going forward, as of January, 2021, we are going to consolidate uh, these uh, reports uh, so that they are um, in one single report. Next slide uh, shows this in greater detail. So the uh, reviews now will have a single cover page, a single disclaimer, a single table of contents, and uh, a single summary, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then we will have the different sections and they will all be available in one combined report. So we hope that this simplifies things, certainly from uh, a website perspective it does, but it also ensures that when you download a review, you have all the pieces in one place. Next slide. Another big change that we are doing is we are going to be uh, inserting short project summaries at the beginning of all of our products. Next slide. So with the exception of reference lists, we are going to be uh, including key messages and abstracts at the front end of our uh, products. And then for the more complex projects, we're gonna supplement them with a project and brief or briefing note style summary. And in the next slides, I have some examples of, of what this will look like. First, I guess some details on this. So the key messages, the key messages will be three to five bullet points and they're gonna help the reader determine if the report is relevant to them. So the goal here is that after someone has read the key messages, they can filter this and say whether or not the report is of interest to them. And if it is, they can continue to read more. Following the key messages, we'll have a, an abstract. The abstract will be about one to five paragraphs. We're gonna fit it in a one page maximum. And this will provide a very good overview of the report. And our goal here is that after you've read the abstract that you'll be able to talk, talk intelligently about the review. Next slide. So here's just a mock-up of, of a previous uh, CDR um, review laid out as uh, how it might look going in uh, January, 2021. So you see the single cover page, the single table of content, the summary, and then on the very far right hand, this is what the summary page will look like five bullet points with your high level key messages. You read those, decide if uh, this is of interest to you. And then an abstract, which might bleed onto the next page that we don't see here, um, but all contained within, within um, a short five paragraphs. Next slide, please. So we'll be also, uh, sorry, the previous one was showed the review. We'll also be doing this with the recommendations. So here again, we have uh, laid out uh, a previous CDR recommendation in the new format as a CATA 3 reimbursement recommendation, single cover page, disclaimer, et cetera. And then on the far right-hand side, we have essentially a one-page summary of the reimbursement recommendation. While you won't be able to tear this out of the document because we do publish online, essentially it is um, something that you could use uh, to, to get the full explanation of the recommendation. Next slide, please. So for our larger uh, and more complex reviews, um, and this would primarily be, I think, with our optimal use uh, and HTA products, which we are rebranding health technology reviews, we will have a one-page standalone uh, summary. So we have been doing that for a while, but it hasn't been uh, consistent. So uh, they had gone under the name a report and brief or a project and brief, but we are going to become consistent with this. Consistent with this. So this one page summary will provide key decision makers with an overview of a project. So the rationale for the review, what the external environment is, out of the findings and their implications. And after someone has read the project summary, they should be able to have an intelligent conversation about the topic, not just a report. So 
as I said, we have done these in the past. We've been a little inconsistent on it, and our intention is to become much more consistent on these um, projects, which are more complex or larger. Next slide, please. This is an example of what it would look like. Uh, it is a standalone document. So um, if, if you need to brief somebody within your organization, uh, this may be the document that you would be able to uh, send around with your notes that would provide the summary of the report as it went forward. So this is again, just an example of a previous CDR review and we haven't used any real text in this, um, but uh, you get a sense of what it will look like going forward. Next slide, please. So Trevor touched on this already, so I'll just uh, reiterate. Um, uh, for those of you who have uh, subscribed to the Pharmaceutical Review Update or the CADAP Healer, uh, you'll, you'll know that we send out a lot of emails and a lot of updates. So typically we'd be sending between five and seven uh, timely e-alerts a week, and then the CADAP uh, reimbursement uh, review update um, on a monthly basis. And this is just an example when we had a call for patients and clinician input, out it would go as a single email. So going forward, next slide. Um, we are going to consolidate all of the emails and um, the update into a CADF weekly summary. And as Trevor had already noted, this will list all the open calls for patient and clinician group input. So it won't just have the ones that are new that week. It'll have every one that is open. So if uh, you missed one from the previous week, if you get the email, you see it, you'll see all the opportunities in one place. Um, we'll have our final recommendations, the provision algorithms, and any updates to the program, all contained now in the one weekly summary. So the weekly summary as we launched um, right now is just on the uh, drug portfolio, but we will be expanding it to the health technology reviews uh, in the new year. Next slide, please. So as I said, we launched this on November 5th. I hope uh, you did notice and I hope uh, you like the format and we'd certainly like to hear any feedback on it. This is just an example of the one that we sent out on November 5th where all the information that you need uh, regarding our reimbursement review program is contained now in a single email. So you don't have to cobble together your five to six emails, seven emails that we send a week and the uh, reimbursement review update. Next slide. And this is my last one. So today, I guess I'm officially announcing the Canadian Journal of Health Technologies. Next slide, please. So in January, we are going to be launching the Canadian Journal of Health Technologies. And then Nicole Mittman, who you met earlier on this call, will be our um, managing editor. Um, what excites me about this is many things, but one is that we are going to be consolidating all of our final reports in one place. We do know that the website um, is very large and for a lot of people it's difficult to navigate. Uh, the final reports will be available on the website, but they'll also be available in the journal. So once a month we'll be uh, bringing everything together and uh, you will be able to see all the final reports in one place. We're hopeful that this is going to help us reach some audiences as well that, um, that are interested in our work, primarily clinicians and health researchers. And a big thing for those in the publishing world is that this is really going to simplify our report indexing and our searchability with some of the large global um, uh, medical libraries that are out there. But right now, we submit a lot of our reports, not all, but a lot to them, uh, but they are submitted in different formats. Our volume and issue numbers are um, not consistent. So starting January, uh, this will consolidate everything into one journal. It will be all inputted under one ISSN number, uh, and it'll make it a lot easier to find um, uh, on these international uh, libraries. Okay, next slide, please. So there you go. So we are shifting from 30 uh, product brands down to four product brands, and uh, you will start to notice that starting in January as the cover pages uh, change. Uh, we'll be publishing our multiple reviews as single reviews. So right now you're used to seeing a clinical review and a pharmacoeconomic review as separate reports. They will be combined. Um, we're inserting our key messages and abstracts into all of our reviews. You'll start seeing that uh, within the reimbursement reviews, but also the health technology reviews that are drug uh, topics. And then on any of the key projects, we'll have uh, a large project summary. We have replaced our e-alert uh, notification system with the CADF weekly uh, summary. And then in January, we are launching the Canadian Journal of Health Technologies. These are five initiatives that uh, we hope are going to help simplify CADIS, but they're just the beginning. We have more uh, coming, so stay tuned and uh, certainly welcome any feedback on this or other ideas that you have. So that's it for me, Brent, and I'll pass things over to you. Great. 
I just want to thank everybody for um, presenting today. I know it was um, a bit of a last minute pulling together of all the information, so very much appreciated. Um, just a reminder to folks, uh, we will be bringing down the slides uh, for the forum presentation uh, and bringing up all the speakers to respond to the questions, which Suzanne will be moderating. Uh, the presentation has been uh, recorded and it will be posted on our website. As we mentioned, uh, we are not putting up the slides separately, uh, but certainly if there is a particular slide that you to look at, you can uh, pull that up through the uh, recording as well. So I think at this point, I'll hand it over to Suzanne and, and we'll move into the open forum session. Thanks very much, Brent. And thank you to my uh, team here at Cadith. Uh, a lot of great information has been shared this morning. And uh, thanks to everyone in the audience, a very active uh, question and answer uh, um, uh, blog going on here. I'm going to do my best to work through all of the questions and uh, but to be able to do that I may have to combine some where there's some common themes and I will toss them to who I think is the appropriate person. If not, they will redirect it to who they think it should go to or others may chime in. <clears throat> I do want to thank individuals who also have just made some general observations about transparency or our website and searchability. We will keep, uh, we do actually look at this um, document that uh, uh, exists from the questions and answers and that's helpful for us to be looking at quality improvements as, as well. Um, so I'm going to start with the question about, <clears throat> I apologize, I think uh, Trevor this one is to you. Um, a comment about CADETH needing to be more transparent about when clinical panels are used. Um, and a comparison is being drawn between um, an, an NS example where it flags it, but a CADETH review document that does not. So perhaps if you could just speak to generally uh, uh, this topic and uh, what it looks like now and uh, uh, anything else people should be aware of. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. Um, so I, I think we are transparent and I, I think, um, you know, the specific issue that was raised about this not being included in the CADETH uh, reports and documents. Um, so I, I'm not sure how that um, conclusion was arrived at, but I, you know, all I can say is that in fact it is like this information is explicitly included uh, in our reports. So um, in terms of transparency, you know, I'm not sure if, if that was potentially missed, but uh, um, it is included. I think we'll leave it there, Suzanne, uh, considering the volume of questions. And you're on mute, by the way. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Um, I, it's noted uh, uh, um, that sometimes CADETH requests a full review of SNDS from Health Canada for a formulation change. Can you explain why CADETH asks uh, for that and understand, help folks understand why a CDR review is needed when it's only the formulation? So I'm assuming again, Trevor, that one might be for you or Brent? Yep. Um, so yeah, uh, I think we've, we've got pretty clear guidance um, that, that's available on the website and in the procedure about when we would require a, a review for a new formulation of existing drugs. It does clarify exactly where we think this might be appropriate. But I think the key point here is that uh, we always take these decisions uh, ultimately to the drug plans, to the public payers, for them to provide us with guidance as to when they would uh, need a review to be done. So we're not in the business of doing reviews where they're not necessary, that's for sure. Um, that said, um, where the drug plans do uh, signal to us that a review would be required, um, typically these are a very small number of uh, the total number of reviews that we do. And they're quite often, in fact, the majority of them are handled through our uh, tailored review process. Thanks, Trevor. Um, and Nicole, a couple of questions for you. 
Um, a couple unrelated, uh, but the first one uh, was uh, how many scientific requests have you received in 2020? So if there's any numbers that you can share. And then there were some questions about uh, the real world evidence group, both questions about a document that you referenced, um, as well as sort of some, some feedback about uh, what are we learning from others so that we're not in the circumstance of, uh, as people often say, reinventing the wheel. Thank you. And just to clarify, Suzanne, I think you mean scientific advice requests? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. So, um, yes, before, I mean, before uh, COVID, uh, before we put a pause on that program during COVID, uh, we had about 10, if I can recall, uh, requests that have come in since the beginning and since now. And now I think we're focusing on three or four of them that are actively moving forward as well. Um, I, I really appreciate the comment on the uh, not reinventing the wheel. We are very cognizant that a number of groups have talked about what does good real world evidence look like. There are guidance panels, there are international and national sort of guidelines as well. Uh, and then also there are checklists that look at the quality of that uh, particular work. So we're trying to leverage that work as well, but there are specific kind of practical issues for organizations that uh, look at health technology or conduct health technology assessments. And some of them are around the source of the data, the independence of the data, um, the, the outcomes that are collected, uh, the frequency with which they're collected. So not necessarily around you know, making sure that you have the best quality data, but then also thinking about the practical issues. So I, we take your point and we're, uh, again, not interested in reinventing the wheel as well. Thanks very much, Nicole. Um, uh, Trevor, I think in your presentation, you also talked a bit about the uh, provisional algorithm process and uh, uh, referenced sort of the timeline that people would have. Uh, could you just uh, reinforce uh, that information for the audience? Uh, sure, happy to. Um, I think we're a couple of questions related to that. Uh, just to clarify that stakeholders will have 10 business days to provide uh, initial input um, when these projects are launched and, and announced. And then they will have uh, five business days to provide feedback on uh, the draft report that comes out of, of the panel. Um, and really just by way of explanation, these are the timelines that have been established based on stakeholder feedback that we received to ensure that you know, the challenge, there's a balance between um, providing sufficient time for input and not delaying essentially access to new medications. So those are the timelines in place. Um, in, in terms of the detailed procedures, those are available in our documents uh, for people to look at, but briefly it will involve uh, a scope that's produced, opportunity for stakeholder input panel deliberations, feedback opportunity for the draft report, and then finalizing that report and posting it. Thanks very much, uh, Trevor. And uh, Nicole, there was also a timeline question for you, and I, I, I don't know that this is nailed down yet, but a question about uh, uh, the timelines for your deliberative framework session with patients and then subsequent consultations. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we're not, uh, we don't have the timelines nailed, but the idea would be that we have our education session in the new year and then quickly afterwards have the question and answer session around the, uh, the, the types of questions that we're interested in looking at from a, a scope perspective for the patient group. So we're hoping shortly in the new year, but we're just working out logistics and trying to figure out how to do that because we imagine there will be a lot of interest from patient groups and we want to make sure that everybody has opportunity to provide feedback we're just thinking about the best way to put that together. Thanks, Nicole. And Sarah, for, there was a, a thank you for the uh, work that you do in support of patient uh, groups. Um, and also a question about uh, what format does the patient input um, uh, uh, get presented in our reports? And is it shared with other key uh, partners in the, in the um, the pharmaceutical system with PMPRB or with the PCPA, et cetera. So if you could maybe just uh, give a little bit of background about the, the input that we receive and how it's used. Certainly. So um, there are historically are a couple of minor differences between the oncology and the non-oncology, um, but certainly going forward, 
patient input as it comes in, um, and we in the non-oncology space do this within uh, roughly sort of two weeks of the input coming in, it is posted in full on CADF's website. So anybody at that point is able to read it, whether um, that's people from Ines or Health Canada, if it's um, happening at the same time, that information is available. Um, and that is up on our website during um, while, while the review is underway at CADF, um, as well as being incorporated, um, a summary of that information is incorporated into our clinical reports, the economic reports, as well as the recommendations. And then it becomes part of that whole package. So both the original input that came in from the patient groups, as well as that synthesis is the package when the uh, review is complete. Thanks very much for that answer, Sarah. Um, uh, Trevor, uh, with regard to sponsor engagement, um, there was some question about what does the process of ongoing engagement look like? Is there one post review meeting or will there be other opportunities for engagement? Uh, so perhaps if you could uh, talk a little bit to that topic. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I really, again, I, I'd ask people to refer to the procedure, but in terms of engagement, uh, we've moved from the, the one formalized engagement for PCODER, which is the checkpoint meeting, to essentially a process that is, is kind of fit for purpose where we will ad hoc and as needed reach out to the sponsor uh, at any time during the review um, to get any additional information as is needed uh, to, to complete that review. So it's a much more agile and flexible process and the, the real intent there is to avoid uh, um, any uh, delays to the process. So that's the process we've, we've kind of evolved on the non-oncology side and this will be uh, put into place for all of our reviews. Um, as I said, it's flexible and adaptable and uh, we hope that uh, it ultimately will make things more efficient and avoid um, undue delays. Thanks, Trevor, and it's, helpful, and it's helpful to know that um, uh, the focus is on that agility of response and, um, and it's good to remind folks to go back to the, the updated documents that were released uh, not that long ago. Um, I guess one of the questions just is a nomenclature question and I'm gonna uh, toss it back to you as well, Trevor. The question is, uh, do CDR and PCODER continue to exist within our new aligned process? And, or have those program names been, programs in air quotations, been discontinued effectively? Um, if so, will there be name changes? Um, <clears throat> yes, I think that was from Jerry. Um, so just to clarify, yes, absolutely. CDR and PCODER um, do currently exist as programs and will continue to exist as programs because of our funding structure. Um, and because of that, um, they will continue to have distinct advisory committees, uh, namely CDEC and uh, HERC. <clears throat> I think what we have done in terms of harmonization and alignment really is the, what's under the hood. So um, all the, the processes and procedures that underpin these two programs are now harmonized as well as the outputs. But just to reemphasize that uh, CDR and PCODER uh, do still exist as programs um, due to our, our funding structure. Thanks, Trevor. Um, and I, I, this is obviously top of mind is uh, the circumstance of COVID. So um, like all things, there's much uncertainty around this topic. But uh, the question is, is if a new drug is coming to market for the treatment of COVID, uh, will it likely need to be submitted for CADETH, uh, to CADETH for review like all other drugs? Um, so maybe what we could do is sort of just start off with Heather, uh, some general uh, comment about what we know about the, the COVID uh, treatments, and then um, I'll ask uh, uh, Trevor or Brent to weigh in. Perfect. Thanks very much, Suzanne, and thanks for the question. So in terms of the COVID work, um, we have a team internally that are monitoring clinical trials for treatments for COVID. Uh, and so when it appears as though something is becoming closer to market authorization or submission for market authorization, so the end of the kind of pivotal clinical trials, 
uh, we will undertake a, a discussion internally to determine what kind of analysis we can provide to uh, really explain what the evidence is telling people. So it is a topic by topic discussion, but we are monitoring on an ongoing basis, the clinical trials for treatment for COVID. Um, I, and I'll, I'll turn it over, I think, to Brent or to Trevor, um, anybody, any manufacturer who has a treatment and they would like a formal assessment with re funding recommendations or you're, you're questioning whether you would like and are eligible for, there is an eligibility form available online. You would submit it to requests at cadeth.ca and then we can undertake a review to determine which path that should go to. Um, currently, there are a number of clinical reviews for drug products uh, used in the treatment of COVID-19, for example, remdesivir, hydrochloroquine, dexamethasone, uh, really to summarize either an individual clinical trial and talk about its strengths and weaknesses, or to summarize the body of available evidence, um, as well as talking about strengths and weaknesses of the body of the literature that's available. That's a great answer, Heather. Uh, Brent and Trevor? Nothing to so, add? I don't think we have anything to add. I think the key thing that uh, Heather mentioned is if there are questions, please submit it into requests at cadeth.ca and we can triage that appropriately within the organization and get a more detailed response back to you. Great. Um, Trevor, you obviously had a lot of the content today, so you're also the focus of uh, lots of the questions. Um, so there was a question about uh, where a recommendation would have a major, major revision um, and have a draft recommendation as an output. Uh, and the question was, will feedback be sought from all of the stakeholders on the revised draft recommendation? So the answer is yes. Good. <laughs> Um, and uh, Nicole, I know why you asked me to clarify the question. Uh, there is also a question about how many times have we used real world evidence? And uh, I first want to say thank you. I really appreciated your response because I, I think it's uh, not always top of mind how much real world evidence we already use. Um, but perhaps you'd like to, to respond to the question about, you know, how frequently is, uh, are we using real, real world evidence at this point? So th thanks for that question and it uh, adds a little bit of angst because I'll answer it with respect to how do we define real world evidence, particularly if we use a formal sort of FDA definition, it's around usual care. Um, if we expand it to look at non-interventional clinical trial evidence that is collected within the context of a non-clinical trial environment, we could actually start to expand the use or the definition around what we actually have received for real world evidence. I think I'll, I'll hand it over to Trevor in a second, but you know, thinking a little bit around if we receive a submission that has utility or health preference data that doesn't actually come from the clinical trial itself, but was collected outside of a clinical trial paradigm, that could be considered real world evidence. When you're submitting data for your budget impact analyses, for example, where you look at utilization of products or comparators, that could be considered real world data. So I think we need to be a little bit nerdy and define it a little bit better. And then we can, I can, we can think about how, what the opportunities are for the submissions around that. And maybe Trevor, if you had anything to add there. Uh, sure, so I think that's a great answer. Um, uh, we don't actually keep statistics on uh, which reviews included RWE because I think the intent is for our teams to use as much relevant information as possible. And this actually includes RWE uh, as Nicole alluded to, it depends on what your definition is, but uh, RWE in its various forms and guises is really routinely included in almost all of our reviews. Uh, again, we don't have a detailed statistical breakdown of, of what that is. Um, but uh, I think I, particularly in resubmissions and reconsiderations, uh, RWE frequently is a major um, component of the evidence that is considered. So uh, I, I'll just remind people of uh, probably two or three years ago now, a change we made to our resubmission procedure, uh, which used to require that you had a new RCT to be eligible. We did away with that uh, specifically to accommodate um, the inclusion of RWU, and we're happy to say that that really is becoming um, more and more pervasive uh, in our reviews. Thanks very much, Trevor. 
Um, there's another question on real world evidence uh, that I'm going to uh, toss your way, Nicole. Um, I think you've touched on it a bit, but maybe just to expand on it. Um, you know, and I think it goes to defining what is real world evidence and what are the categories. So there is a question about are we uh, looking at determining what real world evidence is based on patient reported outcomes and not just real world evidence or data that may be uh, perceived as irrelevant to patients. So um, I don't know if you or um, Sarah want to make any observations on that question. Uh, I can certainly start and then hand it over to Sarah if she has anything to add. I mean, this is why the definition is so important, right? It can include uh, simple administrative data, comparative data, utilization to patient reported outcomes, to patient experience measures. And when we start to get into the technology space, you know, what is what are information coming from wearables, right? Um, and so but because we're not just looking at uh, drugs, uh, we also think about devices and clinical interventions. There's lots of data that can come from different kinds of registry, whether that's safety data, uh, symptom data as well. So the, the definition is really important around real world evidence and certainly patient reported outcomes or symptom data or burden data is important to consider in this as well. I don't know, Thank Sarah, you. if you had anything to add? Nothing more to add. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Randy, a question for you. Um, just could you uh, recap on, on how many reports will now be posted for a drug review? And will all existing reports be combined into one? So could you just uh, speak to that? So I think the question is, is both um, how many reports will now go into uh, to become a drug review? And are we actually going to be doing anything with the old ones? So I'll answer the second part first. We're not gonna be doing anything with the old ones. This is a forward looking initiative. In terms of the number of reports, um, I'll look to Brent, Trevor and Sarah to correct me if I'm wrong, but we will be publishing the uh, patient input as it's in its raw format as we currently do now. That's published before the reviews are uh, completed and shared. Then when it comes to the actual review, there'll be a single review document that will combine the um, clinical, pharmacoeconomic, and then if it's a gene therapy, there are some other uh, components that will be part of that. So that's the second document. The third document is the uh, recommendation, and that is a standalone document. And then uh, we do have two other ones um, that uh, aren't used consistently, but we have an implementation uh, report uh, when required, and that would be posted after the review and recommendation. So that would be the fourth document. And then the fifth one is the provisional uh, algorithms. Um, so in, in the end, there'll be five. So we've simplified it, but it's still a number of documents that will get posted. Thanks, Randy. Um, I, Trevor, I'm going to send this question your way, and I apologize. I'm having an acronym blank at the moment. So the question is, are there any differences in review or review recommendation timelines between original, NDS, or submissions through SRT? TD. Um, so, I didn't see that question. Uh, the, the you're, having running, the same, you're having the same <laughs> acronym block as me. I feel better. <laughs> yeah, I, the acronym uh, is, is NO. It's no. <laughs> there are no differences. So uh, we have a, a standard review timeline. Um, the, the way to accelerate a review, but potentially that was the root of the question is to, to come in through the pre-NOC process, but the review timeline it's, itself, it doesn't change for those different uh, vehicles. Thanks, Trevor. Um, Nicole, a couple of questions on the journal. Uh, is the journal going to be free? Um, are, are, is it going to accept uh, other type of, of content as well? Thanks very much for that question. Um, it will be posted online through the CADF website. So yes, it will be accessible freely. Uh, the there are, right now we're streamlining the reports and, and, and working on version control, but there are many opportunities for us to start to think about what other things could be posted in the journal. So example would be for those folks who submit abstracts to the CADIS symposium, uh, they aren't uh, citable right now, so could they be uh, attached there? 
Are there international comparisons that we can work with other health technology agencies on looking at their policies or methodological reports, those kinds of things. And potentially downstream, this could actually turn into something or spin off into a, a peer reviewed kind of endeavor. Uh, that's certainly not on the horizon for the next couple of years. Uh, and then potentially we could think about external uh, reviews from a peer reviewed manner but certainly when we're thinking about um, the kinds of articles, you know, we, we're actually just trying to formulate our plan. So certainly thinking about uh, information from uh, federal, provincial and territories, policy, external uh, pan-Canadian health organization data as well could be part of this, Health Canada kinds of data. So we're just now starting to understand the, the concept of publishing a journal and the potential. So there could be opportunities for that in the future. Uh, and thanks for those questions. I know uh, the Cadith team and Nicole in particular is very excited about uh, this opportunity uh, and a place to be able to showcase some uh, can Canadian content. Um, uh, obviously, uh, there is a, a question I'll come to about international comparators, and and we do think that uh, there there is an opportunity for Cadith's voice to be to be differently heard through different uh, venues uh, than than simply the reports and the posting on the website. So we look forward to all of that work. Um, there's a, a specific question, and I, I think this question is for you, Trevor. Um, as of today, have any clinician groups made input submissions for non-oncology drugs under review? Uh, sure. Uh, so simple answer is uh, yes. So uh, immediately upon uh, that uh, procedure being launched, uh, we were really pleased to, to see that there was a, an immediate uptick. So yes, uh, that is happening. Great. Um, I'm going to flip this question to you, Nicole, because I, I think it ties into the, the information you shared on the deliberative um, framework. Um, it's sort of a, a question about, um, about uh, clarity about um, how, how do the different components of an HTA get weighted in, in a decision? So the weight of the clinical, the patient input, the economic portions in the final decision, for example, um, you know, uh, how many members vote against or for something? Uh, how, how are those kinds of uh, thinking about how you get to the end recommendation um, uh, looking at in the work that you're doing right now? Because I know you're doing sort of a, a international search on this as well. Well, thank you very much. And that's really part of our environmental scan as well as to understand how other health technology agencies actually uh, deliberate and what information they use in that deliberation process. So do they use sort of multi-criteria decision analysis? Do they use weights uh, and looking at best practices that way? And even looking at the process by which they vote, uh, vote at the beginning, vote in the middle, vote in the interim, um, uh, who gets to vote, who sits at the table, who's a non-voting member. So all of those things are under consideration as we look at uh, updating and, and harmonizing our three committees. Great. Um, two questions for you uh, um, coming up, Trevor. So one is, uh, can you comment at all about uh, Project Orbis and the mandatory information sharing or how is the mandatory information sharing requirement impacted by Project Orbis? Uh, sure, I mean, we could talk probably at length about this, but I'll, I'll keep it simple. Um, so basically, Orbis is a challenge for a number of reasons when it comes to the information sh sharing question uh, and how that is a challenge. Basically, because there is an international collaboration between Health Canada and other international regulatory agencies, uh, we're not able to access and Health Canada will not share um, information related to those reviews um, that are really the purview of other agencies with uh, CADF or NS. So really, it doesn't really apply to a lot of the information that is being used for Orbis. Uh, we can um, access if, if uh, there's the information sharing agreement is signed, we will be able to access uh, whatever work is done by Health Canada relative to the Orbis review. So I hope that clarifies it. Um, it is a challenge given that we don't have access, as I said, beyond um, the work that Health Canada is doing at DeNova for those reviews. 
Thanks, Trevor. Um, there was another question um, uh, in response to a, a comment you made in your presentation. Could you clarify what is meant by at least as clinically efficacious and safe as comparators for a CMA to be appropriate? If a new drug shows no merit, I, I think you have the, the question in front of you. If a new drug yeah. shows a different comparator, could you help explain that, the comments you shared? Yeah, I think anyone um, in, in this field will, will know that um, you know, uh, for cost minimization to make sense, uh, the product really needs to be, um, we don't like to use the word comparable, uh, that just implies that it can be compared which is a necessary requirement, of course, uh, but that it be similar. And I said at least because ideally you want to actually show that you're better than the comparators. Certainly you cannot be worse unless you're looking at a cost utility analysis, which includes a whole lot of other factors, which could still result in that product being cost effective. So when we say at least, I think people realize this is, you know, uh, that the product is similar uh, in terms of the overall clinical uh, effects. Uh, you know, when we talk about statistical versus numerical uh, differences, I think statistical significance is a widely established um, parameter that's, uh, you know, used worldwide, uh, particularly by all regulatory agencies. In the end, CAV's job is simply to appraise the clinical evidence and use that to allow our committees to de deliver recommendations. So really the bottom line is ultimately it'll be at the discretion of our expert committees uh, to make a determination as to whether or not um, the new product is in fact similar to the other product um, using statistical uh, significance, clinical uh, significance and uh, other data as needed. Thanks, Trevor. There was a question also asked about whether any of CADA's programs or products or services were on hold. And I, I think you heard during uh, Brent's presentation of the tremendous work effort that was done to transfer all of our committees um, to become virtual. And I have had the pleasure of uh, listening into those and they certainly remain a, a very dynamic discussion despite virtual and without being in the same room. Um, uh, we, as, as uh, Nicole shared, um, our scientific advice program is now back online um, with products going through it. It was paused as we had to redirect internal staff as part of our COVID response. Um, there certainly are other projects that may have been differently prioritized over the COVID period um, with a limited uh, uh, resource capacity and certainly a changing a demand profile for the, the requests that were coming into Cadith. Uh, we did focus on COVID related um, uh, products for, I think from Heather's presentation from sort of uh, late March through uh, most of the, the summer this year to be able to respond to the demands that were coming to, forward to us uh, related to COVID specific. And as we've moved into sort of this fall period, uh, we're working through, uh, you know, I, I would call it rebalancing, getting back to what were things that were coming in that were non COVID specific, figuring out where is the right balance of reactive and proactive work and what things are we going to need to continue to keep our eye on the ball for with COVID. And I think as, as Heather shared, you know, those products that we need to continue with living documents as the evidence is changing quite dramatically. So I would say at this point, uh, we don't have any programs or services um, on hold, uh, but we are having to make deliberate choices about uh, what work is getting done and in what order. Um, Nicole, there was another uh, question to you um, that actually goes a little bit beyond sort of the drug portfolio and, and it talked about working groups, including oncology drugs and eventually non oncology devices. And so uh, what about oncology devices and device drug combinations that might enable virtual care in the future? Is real world evidence being considered to alleviate the uncertainty for those and any comment about what kind of rigor and, and what kind of pathways might be imagined? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. And, um, and just thinking back about how the initial three working groups were created was based on a survey of the core action team about what are the greatest needs at this particular stage. And those needs were around demonstration projects. Uh, and it's particularly in the oncology space and in the uh, non-oncology space and around drugs. But we also recognize that the real world evidence can be used in the device space and the clinical intervention space. And sometimes those spaces between drugs and devices are actually 
merged or uh, may not need to be as differentiated as they are. So there certainly are opportunities along with the core action team to expand the kinds of projects or working groups that will be looking at these demonstration projects. And I think, you know, lo looking at, you know, specifically around devices, which often have a very quick turnaround for some version controls, um, you know, and, and, or some versions as well, you know, how do we actually ensure that we're getting the right kind of data, the most recent kind of data, and what kind of data are we looking for? So there's very similar questions, whether you're a drug or a device, and some of it also relies on what's the source of the data, how do you analyze the data, what's the outcome you're looking for. So um, I can certainly take that feedback back to the, so the working groups uh, when we have our core action team meeting uh, and ask about if there's any appetite to expand the list of working groups. Thanks a lot, Nicole. Um, uh, no uh, discussion of drugs in the current environment would be um, complete without a PMPRB question. Um, so uh, there is a question about, you know, as the PMPRB will soon be using Cadith based re uh, reanalysis of sponsor submitted cost utility as part of their assessment. Do you see any uh, foresee any changes of, about how Cadith uh, does conducts their work? So I don't know, Brent, if you want to take that question or Trevor wants to take it, Trevor <laughs> or Karen. <laughs> I would suggest that maybe Karen can comment on that piece. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, um, Great. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so it does remain business as usual for us for drug programs in terms of how we continue to do our, our economic reviews. We are in communications um, with PMPRB regarding what information they require to implement their guidelines. Um, and if there are any notable changes to our economic reports, um, this will be tabled with the industry liaison forum. Um, but at this point, um, it, it does remain business as usual in terms of the conduct of the reports and how they're structured. Thanks, Karen. As I said, no, no meeting about drugs would be complete. Um, I think Trevor, uh, uh, Trevor, this question is probably a combination between you and Karen as well. And the question is, if a sponsor chooses to submit a CMA and then during the review, CADA deems it not appropriate for an economic evaluation to avoid potential delays, is there an opportunity to get clarity um, earlier? or through the pre through uh, submission meetings. Um, any observations or uh, feedback that you would give uh, uh, sponsors on this topic? Sure, I could, I could start. Um, people are probably tired of hearing my voice, so uh, Karen, <laughs> uh, feel free to jump in. <laughs> um, I know my dog's tired of hearing my voice. Um, <laughs> So uh, absolutely, uh, I, I think we, we do encourage, you know, pre-submission meetings are not mandatory. Um, but we do find that uh, there's, there's a, a, a substantial uptake and we encourage people, our sponsors to, to uh, use the pre-submission er, uh, meeting. Um, earlier is better, obviously. So again, the pre-submission meeting, we don't mandate when you have to come and see us, but obviously if you want input um, to determine how you're gonna proceed with your economic review or any other part of your review, um, the earlier you come in, the better. So that's a, a key thing to bear in mind. And absolutely, we're happy to provide input um, at a pre-submission meeting on um, which approach uh, is most appropriate. I think just to reinforce, there will never be an argument with the cost utility analysis being pro provided. Uh, and we do not have the ability to screen and provide absolute clarity on whether a CMA is acceptable until unfortunately it's gone through a review uh, for us to be able to do that. So that is the risk um, of taking the CMA approach. But as I said, our team is, is happy to address questions and provide uh, as much guidance as is feasible um, prior to submitting at a pre-submission meeting. Or frankly, uh, you know, if you, if you have a question that you could submit through email, email we're happy to, to take those as well. Thanks, Trevor. Karen, anything to chime into that answer? Nothing further to add. Thanks, Suzanne. That's great. Uh, so we are uh, coming to the end of our time, and I think we've worked our way through a substantial uh, amount of the questions. There were two questions um, directed to me personally, so um, maybe I'll just uh, quickly touch on those um, in my uh, now and uh, before we close the session off. 
Um, so there was a question about sort of what engagement I may be doing on an international basis and what I'm finding out um, with regard to other HTAs. Um, uh, and so the first thing I would say is, um, it's probably obvious to everyone, but starting to work in a new organization during a pandemic is a tad unusual. Uh, it's not only a tad unusual to get to know your staff virtually and um, and without certain meetings happening, having no idea. I've, you know, I, I've physically been in a space for 13 days. Uh, but when you layer on top of that, um, almost every organization that you're working with is similarly working in an unusual work pattern and like Cadith, uh, having to turn much of their attention and time to dealing with COVID related topics and uh, making sort of on the fly adjustments. It, it has not been an ideal time to uh, do as many meet and greets and do in-depth understanding of organizations at this point in time. Uh, what I would say is that I have had the opportunity to uh, connect with a number of uh, other Canadian based um, HTA organizations and organizations that Cadeth works closely with, as well as some introductory um, discussions with international organizations, both individually uh, and through some of the associations and, and collaborative groups. So really look forward to um, expanding that those conversations in the coming uh, weeks and months. And I think in particular, you know, I guess Cadeth is, is I'm going to say fortunate. Uh, we have, you know, we, we are at a point where we need to be thinking forward about our strategic plan just in a timing perspective. But there's, there's nothing like a pandemic to have you look at your strategic plan and uh, think about where you should be going in the future. And I think a lot of organizations are in the same boat. I mean, um, certainly if you follow some of the, the HTA um, leaders that you will see others are going through strategic planning uh, at this time as well. So I think it gives a really opportun a, a great opportunity for Cadeth to be looking forward. There was a question of sort of about um, early observations, and I, I think even in this conversation today, uh, there's been uh, uh, some highlights of the things that, you know, we're working towards, which is trying to get information to everybody in a way that is more useful to them. So the work that's being done on the guidelines to make sure that they're kept current and that you have a place to go to be able to get answers to your questions. Um, uh, the the feedback from Trevor and, and Brent's team about uh, being responsive with agile um, abilities to get back to people and, you know, uh, come soon, come and talk to us, help us figure it out. Uh, the work that Nicole had shared in talking about where do we need to be going and how do we engage um, to make sure that as we move forward with trying to um, put some bookends around our deliberative process that we are getting a good input from uh, patients, clinicians and others. So more to come on that work and the work that Randy shared, which is, um, you know, and some of you very early on in the Q's and A's with your observations about some difficulty with being able to navigate the Cadeth website, et cetera, uh, speak to the fact that if you can't use the information that we produce, it really does lose the value of the tremendous um, scientific and uh, research effort that goes into those reports. So you know, early thinkings are certainly focused on how do we make sure that we have impactful products. Um, the, the last question that was uh, asked of me is just sort of, uh, how does my experience um, uh, make me feel about uh, trying to uh, address sort of the ongoing debates about what should the Canadian um, health uh, pharmaceutical end-to-end -end process look like? And uh, um, I do have the great fortune of having worked across it now in a variety of different capacities. And then I, it's not an easy solution. I, and I certainly wouldn't say it's silos. To me, silos have great big walls and ceilings on and, you know, the information only comes out one place. That's really not what happens. I mean, we do need to be thinking about the, the process end to end. There is lots of opportunity for improvement. But there is a lot of holes, um, and I mean that in the most positive way. Uh, we have a lot permeable walls. There is a lot of dialogue that goes on between Health Canada, CADETH, PMPRB, PCPA, etc. And everyone is at a different place in the journey, and I think that that's sometimes what makes it feel lumpy. Um, but I, I would, I would just say, I. I 
I, you know, I would not characterize the system as having silos. I would say it's a, an evolving system and there's a tremendous amount of good work going on and there's lots of opportunity for that to continue in the best interest of Canadians and innovators. Um, and with that, I would just say, I, you know, I thank everyone for the time they've spent with us today. We really do appreciate you taking such a big chunk out of your day, especially on a virtual call and the enthusiasm uh, with which you ask questions of the team. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, we look forward to continuing our work with you and I look forward to meeting you in new settings and hopefully some in person at some point in time. Take care and thank you from the whole team.